Hi, everyone. For those of you just joining us, um, we have a couple minutes and then we'll get started. Right. Uh, well, as promised, we'll just slowly get going. We see people are still joining. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us in a very important discussion led by our guest speakers, Corey Ranger and Dr. Michelle Danda. My name is Kate Hodgson. I am a nurse practitioner and board member of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association, and I will be moderating tonight's discussion. We have been humbled and overwhelmed with the number and diverse group of registrants, and we thank you for demonstrating an invested interest in involuntary treatment as a policy option. You can go to the next slide, Corey, if you want. I would like to humbly acknowledge that the Harm Reduction Nurses Association engages in work across Turtle Island and honors the life force of Indigenous peoples that have experienced the harmful effects of colonization and continue to resist ongoing acts of genocide. At Harm Reduction Nurses Association, we aim to build a community of practice that recognizes and disrupts ongoing colonization. Addressing the root causes of the toxic drug supply is deeply and inherently connected to actively decolonizing healthcare and drug policy. Our presentation, the, the content discussed today is made possible by people with lived and living experience of drug use, sharing their knowledge and experience. Without their generosity, vital life-saving harm reduction initiatives would not exist. Our presentation this evening has four main segments, which includes opening remarks and housekeeping, followed by two keynote presentations. Tonight's webinar is being hosted in the ethos of advocacy and social justice, saying that there is an expected decorum of mutual kindness, use of person first language, and for those who may not foster a culture of safety and kindness will be removed from the webinar by a moderator without notice. We hope the content generates thoughtful and provocative discussion. However, community member safety is of utmost importance. There'll be ample opportunity for questions and answers after the speakers present. The recording will stop at the end of the speaker's content and the Q&A will not be recorded. You can use the Q&A features in Zoom to ask questions and you can also upvote questions to agree with a question or see a question you would also like answered. Our ancient RNA colleagues, Sarah Lovegrove and Rachel Edwards will be moderating the chat and question, and question period. Sarah Lovegrove is the new vice president of the HRNA and Rachel is the new Prairie representative on the board. We are grateful both have chosen the organization and are able to support educational opportunities like tonight's webinar. Go to the next slide. So the mission of HRNA is to promote the advancement of harm reduction nursing through practice, education, research, and advocacy. HRNA strives to achieve its missions through the following actions, and there are several. Serving as a national voice for harm reduction and related nursing issues, 
promoting education and continuous learning opportunities for nurses, providing opportunities to share nursing knowledge, expertise, and practices, encouraging evidence-based harm reduction nursing practices, creating a dynamic network to support and mentor nurses across the country, advocating for the creation and implementation of harm reduction policies, working together with partners to address structural conditions that create harms, and advocating for the rights and dignity of people who use drugs and their families. Tonight's webinar is the HRNA Mission in Action. Before we get started, we would like to offer a content warning in that our speakers will be talking on several sensitive topics that may have touched many people's lives in our audience today, both directly and indirectly. We understand that the content may be traumatic and triggering for some people in our audience. At the HRNA, we recognize that people who are most impacted by policy decisions are the best people to speak on that policy, and people who use drugs are experts in their own needs and wants. Today, we speak from the perspectives of evidence and the nursing discipline. We acknowledge we do not speak for affected groups, but rather clearly identify our positionality and privilege as we offer an opportunity to provide education. We also acknowledge that there are folks out there whose experiences may vary and some like may even say involuntary care has helped them. This presentation does not diminish those perspectives and we do not deal in absolutes. Our speakers will discuss involuntary care as a frontline policy option, as an oversimplified tool being presented to address complex social problems like homelessness and the poisoned unregulated drug supply. Next slide, yeah. So our aim for tonight's webinar is to cover some specific precipitating events, but more broadly, it is noting that calls for involuntary care is on the rise. We at the HRNA recently signed onto a statement alongside others like Pivot Legal, Wars, the BCCLA, Mom Stop the Harm and Van Du, opposing involuntary care. We offer this webinar as a means to explain and provide a rationale for our position on the subject. I am honored to have been asked to introduce our speakers and colleagues. Michelle Danda is a registered nurse and is a passionate advocate for professional growth and lifelong learning in nursing and mental health. Throughout her career, she has worked in diverse healthcare contexts related to mental health and substance use. She earned her Bachelor of Arts and Honors of Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Sociology from the University of Calgary in 2003. Following roles as a youth care worker and rehabilitation specialist for children with autism, she completed her nursing degree in 2008 and became a CNA certified psychiatric and mental health nurse. She earned her Master of Nursing from Athabasca University in 2012, focusing on education and completed her Master of Psychiatric Nursing at Brandon University in 2018. She graduated from the PhD nursing program at the University of Alberta in June 2024. Congratulations, Michelle. And her dissertation is titled The Evolution of Registered Psychiatric Nursing Education in British Columbia from 1913 to 2012. Her research focused on the evolution of RPN education intertwined with the evolution of the largest provincial mental institution in the province, which is Riverview Hospital. Michelle has served as the Western representative on the board of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association from the 2021 to 2024, and she is currently the secretary and treasurer for the Nurse and Nurse Practitioners Association of BC, and the secretary of the British Columbia History of Nursing Society. She is a parent of four children, ages eight to 14, and she recognizes and honors that she is and honored that she is situated on the stolen traditional ancestral territory of the Halkomalem speaking peoples and is committed to learning from their histories and decolonization. Corey Ranger is also a registered nurse and president of the Harm Reduction Nurses Association. Corey is the clinical director of AVI Health and Community Services and a BC director for Mom Stop the Harm. I will now gladly hand over tonight's webinar to our first speaker, Dr. Michelle Danda. All right, can you see my screen? Thumbs up, all right. So hello, welcome everyone tonight. Thank you for 
attending this. Um, my presentation is going to be on forced treatment in British Columbia, and it is a historical perspective of mental health care. As Kate kindly introduced me earlier, my name is Michelle Danda. I'm a registered nurse. I'm the secretary of the BC History of Nursing Society, um, and I'm most recently the secretary treasurer of NNPBC. And for this dissertation, or for this presentation, I'm sharing with you the research that I did from my nursing PhD, which I completed about a year ago in October of 2023. So here's my agenda. I'm gonna talk about my journey. I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit about what historical research is. I'm gonna talk about a historical journey of mental health care in BC. Briefly, I'll talk about some legislation, pertinent legislation um, to course of treatment and involuntary treatment. I'm gonna talk about the changing structures of mental health services over the history of BC. And I'm gonna ask some questions related to what is a mental health patient and what is care. So here's my journey. You've heard some of it in my bio, so I'm not gonna go over it again, but I'm sharing this information with you to give you some context about who I am and the frame through which I approach my research because it directly influences my understanding of the history of mental health care in BC. And that's reflexive work that I continue to do and that I will continue to do. I've lived in BC for most of my adult life and most of my nursing career has been in the lower mainland BC, so in and around Vancouver area. And I've worked in mental health services throughout my career across the continuum of care. And I'm, I'm gonna preface this talk by sharing with you that I am not an expert in mental health legislation, but I do have an in-depth understanding of how mental health care and mental health nursing has developed and evolved in the province. And also how this has impacted and how it continues to impact who receives care, how they receive this care and what is considered treatment, which you'll see it's changed over time. So to better situate this talk, I'm gonna give you a bit of background info, a bit of, um, uh, of info about historical research. So what is historical research and why do historical research? And I'm hoping that maybe after hearing this, some of you might be interested in doing historical research and that is great and contact me after. Um, so personally, I didn't get historical research until I started my PhD. And I started my PhD in 2018. One of the first courses I took was history and politics of nursing. And it, it resonated with me. I really enjoyed that course. Um, because historical research is a method that it really digs down into the so what of events that took place in the past. And uh, it really allows for critical interrogation of what events mean and how they inform what we do today and where we can move into the future. So historical nursing research, it's, it's more than a special interest project, although I am very interested in the history of registered psychiatric nursing, but the goal of historical research is to inform a broader audience. And in my case, after years working alongside registered psychiatric nurses in mental health services, I had a personal interest in understanding how RPNs came to be, how it was connected to psychiatry, and how this is connected to the provincial men mental institution in BC, in particular Riverview Hospital. And Riverview Hospital, when I started my nursing career, it was really, it was surrounded in a lot of mystique. I heard a lot about it. I didn't know, quite know what it was. I heard about it um, from my colleagues, from nurses, from physicians, and also from patients and their families. So the big picture of historical nursing research, it's to really delve deeply to understand how different pieces of nursing history provide insight into different healthcare contexts. And that is integral to decisions, to approaches, and to understanding nursing issues, but also more broadly healthcare issues. So I realize that not all of you are in the, but all of you are attending an awesome BC. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about BC. Historical research, it really is contingent on particular contexts. That's what's, why it's really integral for me to explain to you the context of BC. Um, so if you didn't know, um, BC is the westernmost Canadian province. It's the one that's outlined in red here. It formed in 1866. The population today is a little bit more than 5 million, 5.2 million. And the historical settlement has largely been along the coast, um, mostly along the southern uh, the southern border, close to the U.S. Uh, and BC has unique labor industries, uh, resource industries like forestry, fisheries, mining, 
and unique politics connected to this, and also a unique gender composition connected to these resource industries. BC also has a strong labor movement. And to understand the history of mental health care, it's really, it's important to understand the types of nursing that exist in BC, because nursing, it's not homogeneous across Canada. BC has four legislated nursing groups, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, who are also registered nurses, registered psychiatric nurses, who I'll refer to as RPNs. Um, and until very recently, RPNs were only regulated in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, so only in Western Canada. And we also have licensed practical nurses. And licensed practical nurses, for those of you in Ontario, they're called registered practical nurses. Um, so RPNs in BC worked primarily in mental health institutions until the 1970s. This changed with deinstitutionalization and the decentralization of mental health services. Mental health inpatient departments were established in the general hospitals in the 1970s. So when you think about this in terms of hospital histories and healthcare, general hospital health units that, that delivered care in acute settings, they're not very old. As I said, my research was on RPN education and Riverview Hospital. My research questions led to an in-depth analysis of RPNs and RPN education in BC over the lifetime of Riverview Hospital, which was formerly known as Espanol Hospital. And it was open from 1913 until 2012, so almost 100 years. Keep that in mind that Riverview Hospital as a provincial uh, mental institution, it closed in 2012 which is now 12 years ago. This Venn diagram right here, uh, it's a summary of my research findings and it shows the different narratives, the three narratives that I constructed and how they interact to create the story of mental health nursing in BC. So this three narratives are that of the evolution of Riverview Hospital, the evolution of RPN education and the evolution of caregivers in mental health care in the BC Provincial Mental Hospital. And so what does this mean? What does it mean in the context of some of the questions that we're asking today? Because we really have to understand this in order to best move forward with mental health care and health care for people who use drugs. So cohesive mental health legislation so think back to the last slide, Riverview Hospital opened in 1913. Cohesive mental health legislation passed in 1964 with the BC Mental Health Act. And these quotes on the slide are taken directly from the Mental Health Act. So this is the language of the time. Involuntary admission and detention was legally allowed for mentally disordered persons, mentally retarded persons, and people for care and treatment as an alcohol addict. Listed below that are the seven original designated facilities. There's way more designated facilities now, but it started with seven. And the Mental Health Act was created through the, the consolidation of five previous laws. Um, they were consolidated to make this more comprehensive Mental Health Act. So this is the timeline of the significant changes in the Mental Health Act. The first graphic here is, um, 1964, that's when the Mental Health Act was enacted. This next moment in time was 1994, which was a comprehensive review of BC's mental health detention system. And then the third significant moment in the Mental Health Act was in 1998. And that was the most recent significant amendment to the BC Mental Health Act. So think about that. 1998 was the most significant amendment to the Mental Health Act. The primary purpose of the Mental Health Act is to ensure the supervision, protection, and care of people experiencing mental health issues through the province, oh, through the provision of authority, criteria, and procedures for involuntary admission and mental health treatment. And the Mental Health Act, it's deployed by physicians with nurses and police to suspend the rights and freedoms of people with mental health issues that are deemed in need of involuntary treatment. So this is taken from the Mental Health Act guide, which was published in 2005, so almost 20 years ago. 
And let's talk a little bit more about involuntary admission. So involuntary admission involves deemed consent, which the underlying feature of this is that it assumes consent on behalf of and in the best interest of service users. The BC Mental Health Act lacks the assessment of a person's capacity to provide consent and the director's physicians or nurses obligation to obtain consent from the service user for this involuntary treatment. Through involuntary treatment, the service user they are legally assumed to have consented. So it goes part and parcel. They've consented to any form of psychiatric treatment that is deemed appropriate by the treating physician. And this is unique to British Columbia. If you wanna know more in this green box, there's two really good um, documents that I recommend you read by Maya Kolar. So this notion of deemed consent which seems consent on behalf of and in the best interest of service users. On the, surface, on the surface, it seems like a helpful piece of legislation, but we have to think about what it really means in practice. And these are the types of questions we should think about as we move forward with proposed legislation to expand the reach of the Mental Health Act and definitions of who the Mental Health Act will apply to. Throughout the history of mental health care and psychiatric care and forced treatment, we can look back on who treatment is forced on how it's happened and how the definitions have changed, um, not only based on social understanding of illness and wellness, but also things like financial constraints, human resource allocation, resource limitations, and also workforce needs. So let's talk about the history of involuntary treatment of drug users, because this is also something that's really important to understand. Um, and I picked out a piece of legislation that I think is really um, uh, important as a foundational piece of legislation here that we need to know about. Um, and it's the Heroin Treatment Act, which was passed in 1978 under, at that time, uh, the ruling social credit government. The operating budget at that time was $13 million a year. And it was for individuals who police suspected of having a dependency on a narcotic, who were then compelled to attend a coordinating center to assess the best course of treatment for their dependency. There was evaluation of this um, piece of legislation, it was found to have no economic benefit, despite this being one of the major arguments for enacting the legislation. And in 1979, it was declared unconstitutional. But in the evaluation, it was found to have actually quite low impact at a very high cost. And it, funded, it funneled funding away from programs that at that time would have a bigger impact, like alcohol and tobacco treatment and prevention. So at that time, the medical profession, the bar, and the BC Civil Liberties Association, they didn't support this Heroin Treatment Act. And the federal government at that time also didn't support it, and they expressed doubts about this idea of coerced abstinence. So this begs the question, what are the conditions today that support some of the solutions being proposed about expanding involuntary treatment? And realistically, what is the hope for this? And what's the ultimate goal? With this, we, we really have to think critically about who are deemed suitable for involuntary treatment, who is assessing this, because it seems like the current talk of involuntary legislation it is an expansion of detention for the purpose of treating people. So maybe let's take a look back at who and what was considered mental health care over time. On this slide, uh, the purpose of this timeline here, it's just a like a very small sheet snapshot of what happened between 1875 and 1996. Um, and the purpose is just to demonstrate that since the first mental hospital type program opened in 1875, there's been a lot of changes and who falls into the category of mental health, health patient. And so this, this influences who receives mental health treatment. So at one time, people with developmental disabilities were cared for in mental institutions, people with seizure disorders, people living with syphilis, older adults with dementia, those were all under the umbrella of mental health patients. And this changed based on the changing understanding of mental illness treatment, and also changing understanding of human rights and also <clears throat> social acceptance of difference. Um, these are two pictures of institutions. One is an example, um, these are both examples of one definitions of mental health patient change. At one point, people living with de developmental disabilities and also incorrigible youth, so like quote unquote problem youth, were patients of the mental health system. 
Uh, on the left here, this is a picture of the industrial school for boys, which was located on the Riverview grounds from 1922 until 1954. And then the picture on the right here is of Woodland School, which was opened from 1950 until 1996. So it actually didn't close very long ago. And over time, when these services were no longer considered under the umbrella of mental health care, these populations shifted to being students. So these were schools, they took care of students rather than patients. And let's talk about downsizing and the closure of Riverview Hospital. Um, these are some of the, one of the reasons, the biggest reason why it closed is the untenable operational costs. Um, increases in efficacy and use of psych psychotropic medications was a huge game changer. And then services were regionalized and this in turn impacted care. In the 1950s, so 1950, that was 70 years ago, it was already well known that large scale central provincial provincial mental institutions were not a viable solution for treating mental illness. Deinstitutionalization, um, it was a process that happened largely in 1960 into the 2000s, and some would say that it's still continuing on today. And in addition, there is pieces of the hospital campus once considered like really necessary for mental health care um, that were no longer viable. And there's parts of mental health care, including colony farms, so things like a mental institution farm, which it was a fully functioning farm that supplied food for Riverview Hospital. That was not, no longer considered part of mental health care. And patients worked on that farm. Um, so they did, they did this work and they supplied food for the hospital. The buildings at Riverview um, were reorganized and repurposed with philosophical and care delivery changes that focused on patient treatment. In the 1960s, the continuum of care, it included acute care, intermediate care, and extended and chronic care. So it really was the lifetime of the patient. Rehabilitation became an important focus of treatment in the 1960s. And this led to the development of new programs and also a lot of restructuring of existing programs. And then into the 1970s, development, evaluation, and organization of community-based mental health services, that was the new focus of the newly formed provincial mental health branch. And then into the 1980s, um, the ruling government at that time was a social credit government. Um, they were fiscally conservative and they developed a plan to fully close Riverview Hospital. And the goal was integrating patients into the community. But these plans, they weren't fully communicated to the nursing staff at the time. And so this leads to the question, where did healthcare and importantly nurses fit into this picture? So the next few the next slides are um, newspaper articles. The first one is from 1974. So between 1973 and 1974, there were 200 fewer patients at Riverview. There are more than 300 additional staff that were hired to replace patients who had previously been doing the jobs for the hospital. So things like gardening, things like housekeeping. Psychiatrists from Riverview started working in community facilities. Um, and then seven community care teams in Greater Vancouver were established. So this is in 1974. And then jump ahead to 1992. By 1992, deinstitutionalization, it was already like more than 25 years in the making across Canada. There was a 75% decline in provincial mental hospital beds. 105 beds closed at Riverview. 67 patients were placed in community facilities. And this was really the first formal downsizing as part of the planned government initiative. So fast forward again to 2000. In the year 2000, there were 800 patients that remained admitted to Riverview. At that time, the medical surgical ward closed because it was no longer being used. And this is a quote um, from the nursing union steward at the time. We used to talk about low morale. Now we have to get a step ladder to get up to that low level. So this is in the year 2000. This is 12 years before that hospital fully closed. And this is 24 years ago. So really, we kind of romanticized what Riverview Hospital used to be. But by 2000, the patient population it had rapidly decreased. It was no longer a fully functional campus. Care was being delivered in regional health authorities. And there was lots of vacancies for physicians and staff nurses at that time. And then fast forward to 2012, this is when the Riverview Hospital fully closed, um, but 
some mental health programs continued to operate. Um, and this was under regional health authorities and also not-for-profit partners. So what was still there? Um, we have to ask the question, like, we see this in the, in the news right now, reopen or new hospitals, close, like calls to reopen it. But we really have to ask the question, did Riverview Hospital ever really close? Um, the underlying assumption is that when we hear, oh, Riverview, Riverview shut, shut down, reopen it, that mental health care stopped being delivered there. Um, but really, the services were redistributed to regional health authorities and to not-for-profit organizations. So what's still there? And there's lots of programs that are still there. Um, and I'll tell you about a few of them right now. So this is Redfish Healing Center. It opened in 2021. This has been in the headlines a lot as well. Um, and this was a relocation of the former Burnaby Center for Mental Health and Addiction. So it's not a net new um, facility. It's a, it was a new facility that was built. Um, and when it was originally opened in 2008, it was built in the former Burnaby health, Mental Health Center and Child Guidance Clinic. So they repurposed a, a building that had a mental health program that opened in 1958. The Maples Adolescent Treatment Center, this is also located on Riverview Grounds, um, and this is taken right from the website. It offers specialized programs and services to address the needs of young people, 12 to 17, who have a lot of mental health concerns and troubling behavior. Uh, this, is, this facility is run by Coast Mental Health, Brookside and Leaside, um, and it's a transitional program for clients that are discharged from Redfish or Heartwood Treatment Center, which is a women's concurrent disorder center located in BC Women's Hospital. Um, this, uh, these 12 cottages on the grounds of the former Riverview Hospital, they are also run by Coast Mental Health and they serve 41 clients. This opened in 2003 uh, and it's transitional housing for people that are involved in the forensic system. This is the Forensic Psychiatric Hospital. It's located just south um, of the Riverview grounds and it opened in 1997. It has 190 beds, it's a facility for people who've been found not criminally responsible for a crime or unfit to stand trial due to a mental health disorder. And this is Cottonwood Lodge and Connolly Lodge is also here. Um, and this is tertiary mental health services. It's longer term treatment for people that are 19 years older who require longer term specialized mental health support and rehabilitation. So those are just some of the programs. Those are some of the services that are still running on Riverview grounds. Um, and I'll end my presentation with this question. And these are important questions to think about. What is care? What are we hoping to achieve with the expansion of involuntary treatment for people who use drugs? How does this fit into the history of mental health care and involuntary treatment in the province? and where and who is gonna deliver this care and how does it align with our nursing ethics? So with that, I'll turn it over to Corey. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was wonderful. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm pleased to be providing the second presentation for today. Uh, and yes, I'm going to be talking about moral panic and involuntary care for substance use. I'm a registered nurse uh, and president of the HRNA, as Kate alluded to. Uh, I'm joining from unceded Cowitzen tribe territory in what is colonially referred to as Duncan. Um, the links uh, between colonization and involuntary care is strong, one of the many reminders that colonization is not merely historical, nor is it an event, but a structure present in everyday policy, insidious and oppressive today. I approach this webinar today as a clinician and student. I have 11 years experience working in harm reduction, community health, withdrawal management, street outreach, public health, and as a nursing instructor, I am also a grad student uh, who's been focusing on this very topic for a while now. Even so, I represent one perspective and there are many still who need to be heard. Uh, and BC goes to the polls on October 19th uh, and both the current governing party and the one vying for the throne have promised some iteration of involuntary care policy aimed at addressing addiction and public safety concerns. The public is being led to believe this is compassionate, this is a necessity a return to common sense 
uh, and a way to guarantee your safety. Today, I will argue that these proposed policy changes are products of moral panic, rooted in disinformation, and will cause more harm than good if we continue to walk down this regressive path. In this presentation, I will use involuntary care as a case study, wherein moral panic and how to defeat them uh, are the real focus. I want you to walk away having learned something new, and I also approach this topic with humility, knowing many of you have expertise in, and experience in this subject as well. Today, we're asking ourselves the following questions. What are the policy and practice implications of a moral panic? How has moral panic contributed to discourse around involuntary care for substance use? And how do we fight moral panic? Uh, how did I come to answer these questions? Well, I completed an annotated bibliography and subsequent literature review on the topic of involuntary care and substance use, uh, completed subsequent rapid review on the topic of moral panics, as well as related subjects like misinformation and disinformation, uh, performed secondary searches, uh, and all of this has been supplemented uh, of me being privileged to learn from others like folks like uh, Dr. Mary Lou Gagnon, Karen Ward, Garth Mullins, Zoe Dodd, Vince Tao, my colleagues at HRNA, my classmates, uh, and my profs who have provided guidance, and most importantly, the hundreds of people with lived and living experience who I've worked alongside or provided care for uh, throughout my career. Uh, this presentation includes 51 total sources ranging from uh, social media to uh, systematic reviews. So we'll start off by talking about a couple of quick core concepts and definitions. Uh, and to kick us off as a bit of a primer, here's conservative activist uh, and overall not cool guy, Chris Ruffo, uh, who cut his teeth on creating a moral panic over critical race theory in the United States, uh, said the quiet part out loud a couple of weeks ago at a Red Deer Networking Canada's conservative movement event, uh, where he said, people say to me, you're engineering a social panic like it's an insult. Uh, and then he, he allegedly followed up by saying, Outrage is fundamental to politics. If you don't have outrage, you're not winning. It's fundamental effect that needs to be channeled and directed. So uh, we're going to dive into that a little bit. But first, just a couple of quick uh, concepts so that we're all on the same page. We'll be talking about a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, and so obviously, uh, just quickly, a multidisciplinary approach uh, is one that draws on knowledge from different disciplines but stays within their boundaries. An interdisciplinary approach analyzes, synthesizes, and harmonizes links, but a transdisciplinary approach uh, allows us to reconceptualize our understanding of the problem and to honor the expertise of those who have been oppressed or silenced by a Western-dominated knowledge. Transdisciplinary approaches allow us to embody the principles of nothing about us without us, ensuring the most impacted by policy are involved in designing, implementing, and evaluating those policies. Our next concept, wicked problems. Wicked problems aren't wicked because they're particularly evil, they're wicked because they're tricky, nebulous, and hard to define, and therefore harder to solve. Some key features of a wicked problem is that there is no consensus on what success looks like. Uh, solutions to the problem are often perceived to bring about irreversible consequences, uh, and the people proposing the solutions are terribly invested in being right, so much so they have no right to be wrong. And is every wicked problem or is every complex social issue a wicked problem? Uh, no, that's just lazy. Uh, we do actually know how to perhaps solve homelessness or, or ameliorate poverty, uh, but we choose to put barriers up for reasons uh, that are not always rooted in evidence or ethics. For the purposes of today's presentation, uh, I will be talking about involuntary care. And so my working definition of involuntary care uh, is that it has many faces. It includes any course of practice that forces treatment compliance on another. That could be in the form of drug treatment courts, incarceration, involuntary hospitalization, forced abstinence, or the incentivization of substance use, tre uh, substance use treatment. And the context uh, for this involuntary care definition is substance use as a frontline policy. There are uh, a number of uh, important topics and important concepts, and we're not going to be able to touch on them all. Uh, but one is the concept of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, people often use these terms interchangeably, and that's not correct. Uh, both forms, uh, both are forms of misleading information, that is true, but the difference is intention. And so misinformation is unintentional. Uh, disinformation, on the other hand, must be created, it must be amplified, and it must be believed. 
disinformation relates to profit, gains, and power. Uh, and a key feature of disinformation is the aim to discredit and sow distrust. The reason why we talk about uh, misinformation and disinformation in a, in a presentation about moral panic is because there is a cascade of disinformation, misinformation to moral panic. Uh, because once, mis uh, once disinformation is created and amplified and believed, uh, it can lead to a moral panic. So uh, from uh, a researcher uh, who has been focusing on the, on the topic of uh, moral panics uh, for a very long time, uh, societies appear to be subject every now and then to periods of moral panic. A condition, episode, person, or group of persons emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians, and other right-thinking people. Socially accredited experts uh, pronounce their diagnosis and solutions. Ways of coping are evolved, resorted to. Uh, and the condition disappears, submerges or de deteriorates and becomes more visible. Sometimes the object of the panic is quite novel and at other times it's something that's been in existence long enough, uh, but suddenly appears in the limelight. Uh, sometimes the panic possesses, uh, passes over and is forgotten. Um, and then sometimes it produces long lasting repercussions uh, such as legal and social policy changes. Those are the words of Stanley Cohen, who's the original author of the moral panic novel, uh, model, uh, who wrote that back in 1972. And one thing about a moral panic uh, is that it's often used pejoratively to denote a gross overreaction. Uh, but what makes a moral panic effective is that some parts of it are true. Uh, it's uh, not completely made up, but the prevalence and severity is exaggerated. The population deemed to be, uh, you know, framed as inhuman because the best lies are tangled in truths. There are four groupings uh, to be crucial to a moral panic, the mass media, the moral entrepreneurs, the control culture and the public. Uh, members of the first group, the media, are instrumental in the early stages of a panic because they help to define and, and demean the deviants. Uh, first, there's exaggeration and distortion of who did or said what. Second is prediction, the dire consequences of failure to act. Uh, and the third is symbolization. Uh, and so there are uh, generally a formula that involves, you know, a concern is brought up and it's reported. Uh, and there's an event that sparks some controversy and sparks some anxiety. Uh, and then that's followed by hostility, uh, where the people who are deemed to be the perpetrators are portrayed uh, in less than human forms. Uh, and then there's a negative social reaction, uh, which is broad and, and unified. Uh, and then the extent of the conduct or the threat it poses is, is exaggerated. Uh, and then the media's reporting uh, and the associated panic emerge suddenly, uh, but can dissipate quickly. And we have a number of examples of moral panics throughout Canada's history and drug policy. Uh, and so what are the policy and practice implications of a moral panic? Look no further than the, the Canada's modern day drug laws. Uh, it's important to note that Canada's first foray into prohibition uh, was via an amendment to the Indian Act, which imposed explicitly on Indigenous people alcohol prohibition. Uh, but also the race riots of 1907, uh, which were largely about preserving the white nation as the media portrayed it, uh, were what led to the introduction of the Opium Act. Uh, we can also look at Emily Murphy's history and her influence uh, and her writing, uh, which depicted substance use as destabilizing, corrupting force within civilized society and casted racialized others as a threat to the white nation. And so most of Canada's drug laws uh, have been born on the backs of, of moral panics. So now that we've got those uh, core concepts down, a short backgrounder on our current day context. There were 2,572 deaths in 2023, and the unregulated uh, drug supply continues to evolve uh, and continues to be more and more volatile. Um, people don't realize that we're... we're moving in past our, our eighth year of a public health emergency. Uh, and back when a public health emergency was originally declared in 2016, there was 996 deaths. 
Uh, and so just last year, there was 2,572, uh, which goes to show you uh, the ongoing uh, and worsening devastation of the unregulated drug poisoning emergency. Uh, and we should acknowledge what the drivers of this uh, emergency are, uh, which is, this is a graph from 2018 from the BC Coroner Service, uh, which showed you know, five different substances being detected in, in drug overdose deaths. And this is from 2022, when there was 12 different substances found uh, in, in illicit drug toxicity deaths. Uh, and now this is uh, just a couple of months ago, 15 different substances, a load of different synthetic substances, uh, producing profound effects like prolonged, prolonged sedation and amnesia, uh, making it increasingly difficult for people who are compelled to access the unregulated drug supply to participate and show up in society as they would like to. Uh, it's also likely uh, a contributor to uh, a topic that we're going to be talking about soon, uh, which is uh, anoxic and hypoxic brain injuries. So uh, you don't have to read this whole quote here, uh, just the bolded and underlined parts. Um, but essentially, uh, this study uh, that was recently completed uh, demonstrated that uh, people who experienced a toxic drug event were 15 times more likely to have encephalopathy than people who did not experience drug toxicity. Uh, and this is made worse and exacerbated by the unregulated drug supply, which is continuing to produce really profound effects on people. Uh, and it is also an important consideration in the discussion around involuntary care, uh, because it is being weaponized as a, as a reason uh, to, to put people into care. It's also important within our current context to acknowledge um, that this is not a new or innovative idea. Uh, history has a tendency to repeat itself, and it feels important to note that today's discussion and musings over involuntary care is neither new nor innovating. Uh, in 2022, the BC government, uh, after significant pushback, uh, abandoned Bill 22, which would have allowed for the involuntary treatment of youth who had presented in hospital for an overdose. At the time, uh, Minister of Mental Health and Addiction Sheila Malcolmson said concerns about potential negative impacts of the proposed legislation led the province to consult further with First Nations, families, healthcare experts, and drug users. Uh, and those conversations reaffirmed the trauma associated with holding youth against their will, Indigenous youth especially, uh, and that led to our decision to not bring uh, bring it back. And so uh, we can see that this, this has already been tried before and there was already significant pushback. In Alberta, the Compassionate Intervention Act uh, has been uh, proposed since 2023, uh, and it would be uh, to allow a family member, doctor or police officer to make a petition to family court for treatment order when someone is a danger to themselves or others. Uh, and then uh, of course, we have uh, in New Brunswick, uh, just recently, not so progressive conservative premier of New Brunswick, uh, uh, Higgs uh, has said that uh, he, they're going to introduce involuntary addiction treatment as well. Uh, and he was quoted as saying, maybe it's 20 below, someone's unconscious, uh, and, and followed by, or you know, that in some cases, they the aggressiveness they could show to the public and the safety. And so there's the framing once again. Someone is either an incapacitated uh, person with an addiction or they're a threat to the public. Just yesterday, the BC Conservatives announced that they would end tent cities. Uh, and at point number three of their plan, they decided that they would do so via involuntary treatment legislation. Uh, and so we can see what's right, right now that you know, calls for involuntary care have nothing really to do with compassion or with protecting the safety, but now we're starting to see them as mechanisms to displace homelessness and to eradicate homeless encampments uh, made further present by uh, on October 3rd when Premier Doug Ford uh, stated his government would look into forced treatment as a response to growing homeless encampments. So now let's talk about where moral panics and involuntary care fit in with each other. How are narratives crafted and shared? Well, whether it's stories of illicit smoke exposure in hospitals, 
people smoking crack in a Tim Hortons, or folks injecting drugs in a splash pad, we saw a very coordinated effort to convince the people of BC that they were not safe. And the main culprit were people who used drugs and the drug policies that supposedly enabled them. This gives rise to the drug user as deviant narrative, an over 100 year old narrative designed to elicit fear, othering and dehumanization, or the belief that some people deserve less or that we can rationalize oppression uh, on the basis of their moral failings and transgressions. Dehumanization is a key feature in genocides. Uh, and speaking of dehumanization, here's BC Conservative L uh, MLA Eleanor Sturko comparing people in the downtown east side to stray animals. Uh, in this, uh, Eleanor Sturko stated, if these were dogs and cats or pets, the SPCA would come and they would take these animals into care and adopt them out. Even former BC United leader Kevin Falcon uh, held a press event in, in Vernon in February, uh, and he said, uh, we would ensure that they're getting the kind of care and attention necessary, the proper psychiatric and medical supports, uh, to ensure that they could be stabilized and in many cases i'm sure uh, also at some point be able to return to the communities as human beings that are now fixed and capable of making contributions to their community uh, he added that many of these folks are not capable of making decisions so now you see the rationalized paternalism the problematic benevolence the narrative of people who use drugs are incapacitated and are unable to make good decisions for themselves and it's propelled into the media uh, and then into the masses. It's common knowledge that substance use and addiction in Canada has been predominantly viewed as either a criminal uh, or a medical issue, uh, and thus over a century of drug policy has been directed to control or stop substance use altogether. Uh, at times, the blending of these perspectives have produced multidisciplinary approaches like drug treatment courses or courts, uh, and the false binary of moral deviant or incapacitated addict uh, is a product of social constructivism, which then allows for the creation of solutions that benefit people who have defined the problem. Uh, there are many actors in here who have power and influence, including politicians and political opportunists. If you're someone who is out there saying, you're unsafe, this is my proposal, vote for me and I'll keep you safe, then there's a reason why uh, they're framing it that way. Police and law enforcement play a major role, whether it's fentanyl misinformation and stories about people touching fentanyl and overdosing uh, and how that leads to othering and further stigmatization and dehumanization of people who use drugs, or if it's them posting pictures of their big drug busts uh, and, and telling folks that you're safe, bring on more police, you're safe, even though there's evidence that shows after a drug bust, uh, risk for overdose goes up in the surrounding area. Uh, all of these different um, folks and, and, and groups have varying degrees of power and influence, uh, and we always have to ask ourselves, qui bono, or, or who benefits? There is a role of media and social media in generating and perpetuating a moral panic. Uh, and so, you know, this video, this, this image to the left uh, is the stereotypical needle in a park. Uh, image, and you'll find that on a number of different news stories that have come out over the last five years. You can buy it on Shutterstock, Shutterstock. Uh, and it is uh, a really easy way right out of the gate for media to frame a conversation, to frame an event, to exaggerate an event, uh, and uh, it just gets worse when it comes to social media as well. So whether generating fear about social change, sharpening social distance, or offering new opportunities for vilifying outsiders, distorting communications, manipulating public opinion, and mobilizing embittered indiv individuals, digital platforms and communications constitute significant targets, facilitators, and instruments of panic production. The spread of information pollution frequently hinges on perceptions of social media as the embodiment of everyone. And so the, there needs to be the belief uh, that when something comes out in social media that everybody's reading it, everybody's act, accessing it, it's not actually true. It's not actually that many people who are reading posts on Twitter, but it's made, you, made for you to believe that that's what's happening. Sometimes fake accounts are utilized to raise awareness and bolster the credibility of favored content. Uh, on the other hand, advances in artificial intelligence allow bots, machine-led communication tools that mimic human, human users and perform simple, structurally repetitive tasks to spread propaganda. 
and so oftentimes there uh, is a number of different strategies underway in order to uh, turn, a, make sure a story survives, make sure a story continues to uh, be amplified and shared by others, uh, and making sure that people are, are generally having an emotional reaction to the stories. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the problem represented to be? Uh, and so this, what is the problem represented to be strategy has been developed uh, by a researcher named Carol Backey. Uh, and the WPR technique is to discern how the problem is represented within policies. Uh, and then we can actually uh, subject this problem representation to scrutiny. Uh, and so she asks us questions like, what is the problem represented to be in a specific policy uh, proposal? When it comes to involuntary care, the problem as it is presented uh, is uh, and the proposed solution is involuntary care. So the problem is public safety and addiction. Uh, and the assumptions that underpin this representation is that people who use drugs are a risk to themselves and others, and, if they're in and that they're incapable of making decisions based on their own health and safety, uh, which gives way to the medical criminal approach. Um, this, the effects produced through this uh, is the manufacturing of consent uh, to introduce involuntary care. We could look at root drivers, increases in homelessness, a poison drug supply, social dislocation, adverse childhood experiences, and affordability, but those are all largely ignored when we look at this in a very oversimplified way. Uh, and at no point in time are people asking, like, what happens when people are involuntary treated and then discharged back into homelessness? Uh, you might be surprised to know that that remains a common occurrence even in voluntary treatment models at this point in time. So in making the case uh, for a new way of looking at the problem and to try and challenge these moral panics, uh, we first should just try to accept the prevailing framing and test it. And so if the problem is addiction and public safety, will involuntary care offer the desired solutions? No. Uh, so uh, Nakahi and associates uh, determined uh, through uh, studying a number of people in Iran uh, who were involuntarily committed, uh, 1,083 adult male uh, people who use drugs, and uh, within two months there was a 96.4% relapse rate. In a, a systematic review from Werb and Associates, uh, they revealed that the current body of evidence on involuntary treatment demonstrates both a lack of benefits and a significant potential for harm. Uh, in a study uh, by Ledberg and Associates uh, found over 17 years and nearly 8,000 individuals who were discharged from a six-month compulsory care period, uh, that the risk of dying after discharge from compulsory care for substance use uh, is high. Uh, and lastly, even uh, former BC Provincial Health Officer Perry Kendall uh, has commented on the matter alongside colleagues in a publication that states the existing evidence suggests that mandatory addiction treatment does not lead to significant improvements in substance use outcomes and can be destabilizing, increasing the risk of subsequent overdose. To continue along the path of deconstructing the narrative, we have to ask ourselves if involuntary treatment is not the solution, then why is it so popular? Uh, according, according to Udwadia and Isles, there's already 38 U.S. jurisdictions and seven Canadian provinces that have some form of involuntary commitment laws on the books. And so if the solution is popular, despite being wholly ineffective and oftentimes harmful, there must be another reason. The victims of involuntary care are well known. Despite poor record keeping, it is demonstrable that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are disproportionately targeted by involuntary care. The racism inflicted on Indigenous people, including those who experience involuntary care at the hands of the healthcare system in Canada, is easily demonstrable in BC's In Plain Sight report. And a study on anti-Black racism in Ontario revealed that rates of restraint use were 44% higher among Black patients than among white patients. O'Brien and Hudson Green spoke to parents of children who had been involuntarily detained and showed that many were disappointed that involuntary stabilization did not have a more lasting effect. So even the people uh, who are trying to get their kids into involuntary care are reporting back that they're not having the desired effect. Uh, and lastly, Health Justice reports that girls, women, non-binary people, two-spirit people, uh, and others with marginalized genders may experience disproportionate challenges and harms when detained. 
from the perspectives of people who use drugs, Cha and associates found involuntary care was coercive means for society to exert control. Uh, and also from a human rights and legal review, uh, authors Lines, Hannah, and Jarelli wrote that some of the most egregious violations of the health, right to health have occurred in the context of treatment for drug dependence. Uh, and what's important to note if we're talking about benefactors is that the creator of the problem is often the one proposing a solution on the condition of a vote. Other benefactors include those who may gain power or resources from their solutions like private treatment facilities or police seeking bigger budgets. We barely touched on the fact that many of these proposals involve establishing services within existing correctional facilities. So let's just quickly talk about what happens when people are released from carceral settings. A study of over nearly 1.5 million people released from incarceration over a period of 38 years demonstrated a high rate of death due to a range of mostly preventable causes, and it was highest in the first week post-release. Uh, this has been replicated in Ontario after a 12-year retrospective study that found people who were released from Ontario prisons uh, were 56 times higher uh, likelihood to die by overdose death within the first two weeks uh, of them leaving. Uh, and so um, we also don't have a voluntary care system. And just a recent report showed that uh, one third of BC's publicly funded substance use treatment beds don't provide any treatment at all. So we have less than we even thought we did. Uh, and so from mumps up the harms, Korean and abuse, how can you even mention involuntary care uh, when we don't have voluntary care? What are the implications of co-opting caring professionals and nurses to act in a way that betrays our values and codes of ethic? Will it make us any safer? Just recently, the HRNA and the Canadian Nurses Association published an open letter, which includes salient excerpts, including prohibition-based policies in hospitals, such as promoting security involvement, requiring nurses to search people's personal belongings, disallowing consumption of substances in safe, controlled environments, and using abstinence-based contracts that include paternalistic disciplinary measures do not meaningfully address safety concerns. In fact, invasive and dehumanizing policies such as searching personal belongings have been shown to worsen health outcomes and create new safety concerns for nurses. There's also been studies about nurses' uh, perceptions and experiences participating in involuntary treatment orders. And so this study from Lissard Duchesne and Gouillet said that most participants in our study were aware of the power imbalances caused by involuntary treatment orders. Nurses emphasized how the management of the involuntary treatment conditions left them feeling trapped between coercion and care. And I think that's really important because uh, we as a nursing profession are at risk of moral injury and moral distress uh, if we're finding ourselves practicing outside of our own principles and values. Uh, and then this um, also a, a, a posting from uh, Polar as well, which sounds like Michelle and I were using some similar sources for this. Uh, and just one thing to highlight here is that um, Maya Kohler says, nurses can promote shared decision-making such that their engagement in a voluntary and coercive treatment would occur in exceptional circumstances only. And I think that's really critical here because what the BC government and the, and the BC Conservatives are, are proposing is, is involuntary care as a frontline option. So how do we combat moral panics? Well, we can make the case for a transdisciplinary approach. We have to make sure that people who use or use drugs are involved, better yet leading, in the development and implementation of policies, procedures, and programs that aim to serve them. And that also includes people most disproportionately impacted um, by uh, involuntary care legislation. We should be rejecting the dominant narrative and framing and recontextualize our understanding of the problem. This is not necessarily an issue of addiction or public safety, but we have larger colliding public health emergencies like a burgeoning homelessness crisis that will not be solved by involuntary treatment. And nurses are not police, bylaw, or hospital security. And as a, as a profession, we must make sure that we are not creeping uh, into those roles and damaging uh, the vital trust that we seek to establish with clients and patients that we serve. There's also legal challenges and a reminder that harm reduction challenges laws and policies that cause harm. And harm reduction is rooted in a commitment to social justice. Uh, and that justice means there are no groups or individuals whose rights are alienable. It is safety, equity, unconditional love, and defined by the oppressed, not by the oppressor. So maybe don't vote for someone willing to circumvent human rights and accountability. This is uh, 
prospective leader John Rustad commenting that the BC Conservatives may use the notwithstanding clause if the courts rule involuntary care violates human rights. This is extremely problematic to hear someone leading with this proposal uh, and shows just what human rights means to him. What can you do? Well, you can listen, uh, listen to people who use drugs primarily. Uh, make sure that you're making space uh, to hear them and to uh, try to uplift their voices. Consider joining groups like the Harm Reduction Nurses Association, Solidarity Committees, the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. It's so easy. You can just go on the CDPC website and, and click join. Uh, Mom Stop the Harm, the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. There's strength in numbers, strength in solidarity. You can fight misinformation and disinformation at every turn. So if there's a needle in a puddle po photo, you can email your local newspaper. Um, I once uh, had someone call me from a small, small town, a reporter, and asked me uh, a very um, biased question about, about harm reduction and enabling. And, and I spoke to him for like an hour and a half. And afterwards, he said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to write this story. Uh, and so there's always an opportunity if we try. Uh, we can donate to existing legal channel challenges like Dolph, uh, and then we must dismantle the moral panic, reframe the problem, demand accountability from elected leaders, and so cut through the noise and ask pointed questions about the root drivers of the drug poisoning emergency. How does this proposed solution address the root drivers of our public health emergency? Why involuntary care when voluntary is inaccessible? How will this get people housing? How will this stop the deaths? These are questions they must answer if they're proposing involuntary care as a solution to our ongoing public health emergency that's over eight year, nearly eight years old. I would recommend a number of great readings, most of them from Health Justice. Uh, there's some great stuff like Fast Facts on Mental Health and Involuntary Treatment. Uh, there's a response uh, regarding uh, the recent announcement of involuntary treatment, and it includes a statement from the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs. Uh, and uh, a, a decolonizing the mental health uh, uh, document, which is fantastic as well, uh, as well uh, from the Canadian Mental Health Association, involuntary care already exists in BC, but is it working? Important contextual pieces uh, so that we can continue to navigate these difficult waters together. And so I'll just close on this uh, quote from this really great article that I read because I've read a billion articles in, in, in learning about this. Uh, and uh, this is from someone named Jessica Wildfire. Uh, she says, we need as many people as possible speaking the truth in every kind of way. We need protests, we need articles, we need podcasts, we need tweets, we need art, we need music, we need memes, we need the truth presented politely over dinner, uh, and we need it shouted in the streets. We need it with a smile and we need it dripping with sarcasm and we need it on t-shirts and billboards, we need it all. There's one last thing we can do and it's going to be hard. We're going to have to figure out a way to offer forgiveness and amnesty to people who finally see the truth and stop fighting it. It's hard to get people on your side if they're scared of, of admitting that they're wrong. Thank you very much. And here's just so many references that helped contribute to today's presentation. And I look forward to some questions and answers now. Thank you, Corey and Michelle, for your presentations. Um, we are going to answer questions, so you can feel free to type them in, and Sarah and Rachel are going to help um, bring those up and, and hand them off. Yeah, we've already got quite a few here. 